Welcome to the New Arab webinar series. If you're joining us for the next time, this is the fifth webinar in the webinar series of the New Arab. The New Arab, as a small introduction, is a progressive and diverse London-based news organization covering the MENA region with a focus on democratic transition, human rights, and social and economic justice. So we had an earth-shattering explosion in Lebanon where hundreds of tons of ammonium nitrate in Beirut port exploded on August 4th, 2020. This has devastated Lebanon's capital city, and it has caused a big shockwave around the world, prompting an inflow of humanitarian assistance and pledges for the city's reconstruction. Over 170 people were killed. In this blast, thousands were injured, and many remain missing. The humanitarian sector already has been used to stepping into the, uh, into the field in Lebanon and to offer help, knowing that our state has been functional and dysfunctional many times for many years before. However, this time it's different because Lebanon has already been undergoing an economic crisis in addition to a pandemic in the world and also in Lebanon. So we decided to um, dive into this conversation tonight and to ask all of the tough questions about what is to happen in Lebanon and what is to happen in Beirut regarding the reconstruction, the government, the state as a whole. And I'll start by briefly introducing myself. I'll be moderating this webinar. My name is Luna Safwan and I am a journalist, a freelance journalist based in Lebanon, covering human rights, freedom of speech issues, refugees, and every humanitarian aspect of the challenging situation, specifically in Lebanon for the past year. Now, we are very happy to be joined by an all women panel tonight, knowing that tonight's topic, which I have mentioned, is a hard one and it does not bring us joy. But I think that we will try our best to map out the humanitarian and the urban landscape post blast to try and envision what could Beirut look like in the upcoming weeks and months ahead, regardless of all of the pain and all of the shock. And I would like to introduce um, our panelists for tonight, whom I am very happy to be uh, moderating the discussion with. We have Dr. Muna Fawaz, who's a professor of urban studies and planning and a coordinator of the Masters in Urban Planning, Policy and Design at the American University of Beirut, AUB. She recently co-founded the Beirut Urban Lab at AUB, a regional research center invested in working towards more inclusive and just and viable cities. We also have Dr. Carmen Jaha, who's an activist and an associated professor of public administration, leadership, and organizational development at AUB and founder of Khadit Beirut. She is also a research associate at the Center for Inclusive Business and Leadership, CIBL for Women, a regional reference for redying gender inclusive employers across the Arab MENA region. I would like to start by trying to dive into um, the, more, uh, the more broad subject. And I'd like to try and explore a little more by asking um, Carmen directly, what do the current politics of this disaster look like for us locally in Lebanon, for the community that has been directly affected um, by this disaster that has happened, but also um, nationally and internationally, knowing that there are a lot of changes that are happening and that we, are, we have been noticing in the past three weeks since the blast. Thank you very much, Luna. I'm very honored to join the panel with Professor Fawaz, and thank you for, for a chance to tell our story and our experience. This is the last thing we would have wanted to talk about. 52 people are still missing, and whenever you turn on the TV, there are funerals from the north to the south of Lebanon. We're still counting our dead, and we still forget, to, uh oh, I forgot to check on this person. This is the last thing we want to talk about, and this is the last thing that we want to be right about. Um, I can just tell for your audience some of the facts that we've been going through before the blast and after the blast. And as one friend told me, a uh, foreigner friend, she said, oh, you can't make this up. And I said, no, you really can't make it up. Um, of course, the year ended with an ongoing protest revolution, one of the first of its kind, and then the deterioration of our uh, currency, but also the banks locking in our money. So literally 
people cannot access their funds. Um, when the Beirut blast happened, um, we said as activists that we will not wait for an investigation because this is a political class who has failed even to pick up the garbage. It's been 30 years since the civil war ended. We don't have electricity and they burn garbage on the street. People have been <laughs> demanding a solution for garbage for the last five years. So we said, we'll not wait for any investigation. We went to the protest on Saturday. We say, for us, the verdict is out. The politicians are to blame. And then they shot people and tear gassed them and beat them up. And you really can't make this up. And then now, 20 days later, not a single official senior resignation. I mean, it's a government that comes and goes. Uh, it's very well known, the, the sources that um, who appoints these, you know, I call it a puppet government, but there's not really been any process of accountability. They continue to shake hands. They think that they will be able to get away with it, like after the war, by granting themselves amnesty, but I am of the voice that this time it will not pass. And just the last thing I want to say is that it's not, it's not just the magnitude of the blast, it's also the timing, as you were saying, Luna, locally, regionally, internationally during a pandemic amidst geopolitical impasse amidst really a data deficit. We have to do all of this research because the you know, Central Bureau of Statistics doesn't even give out demographics. So we were told by a lot of crisis experts in the world that there's really nothing like it. You can't import a guide, a guidebook or a roadmap. You're going to have to build it yourself. So we find ourselves um, here. I mean, we're all still trying to process um, what has been happening in Lebanon. This has been, this has been an ongoing year or a year and a half of crisis um, and the humanitarian sector is not new to this so can you give us a little picture of what the humanitarian landscape looks like on the ground now perhaps with a little overview on what does the humanitarian sector look like in Lebanon in general even before this blast um, and then what does it look like now precisely the point I, I, I'm trying to make in that it is new even for the humanitarian sector because humanitarian aid flows in if there is a conflict, right, or if there is a natural catastrophe, uh, or if there is poverty, uh, with very limited success, albeit. I mean, there are still countries in the world that receive a lot of aid where children still die of hunger. So the model around humanitarian intervention, is either in support of governments or non-governmental organizations, succeeded. I mean, they're all well-intended efforts, but in Lebanon, they stumble upon three main factors. One, the government cannot be trusted with a single dollar, and I think that we were able to kind of make that appeal and win that battle really quickly from the first and the second day because a lot of the donors know the country just as well perhaps as we do. But there is another stumbling block in that, and I think Professor Fawaz will know a lot around this when it comes to the urban. Also our politicians, our major investors and shareholders in very bad contracting companies and food companies and telecom companies. So they are also dealing with humanitarian aid with a second layer of, of corruption and partisan interest. And then a third layer, not all non-governmental organizations are good. A lot of them are sectarian and actually the politicians deplete state institutions on purpose so they can give out money from the back door via their associations and these are very difficult to map out so i think the humanitarian sector the rush of, of flood of money i would say is very much welcome but the situation on the ground is very very complicated and will require us to be very vigilant if we want to outsmart them because they're fast they're very very fast it's an octopus of, of a political uh, um, machine that we're dealing with. And it's also, um, it's, it's amazing to have this type and this number of organizations and of initiatives. But doesn't this also um, overwhelm the people? Because it feels in Lebanon as if we are all left for our own. You know, if I lost an apartment or a house, I need to find the people to talk to. And really, there are a lot of initiatives. So doesn't this really overwhelm the people at some point? So in, in Khadid Beirut, we were learning as we go, right? So we started the hotline and people were calling and shouting and saying, I feel 10 needs assessment surveys. I mean, can you come fix my door? Uh, but let's not forget the reason that we're here is because there is not a disaster risk unit at the prime minister office and because there is not a trusted police force and because there is no ministry of economy. Even before the bombing, there was no ministry of labor when people were losing their jobs. So the reason, that, that there is chaos, confusion, frustration, and fear is because you don't have a trusted central authority. Not a single politician would dare walk down that road. 
and they keep saying, who would you want to run in the future? I said, anybody who's able to walk that line um, and be saluted by the people and not be torn apart. So the reason that we are in this confusion, yes, but it's not because I'm bad or you're bad or NGOs are bad, it's because it's humongous. It's in a split second, 300,000 people lost their roof. 300,000 people. There's still tens of people are here in comas, tens of people still missing. So it is overwhelming to the people and it adds insult to injury. A kid, yani, when you lose your, your livelihood in a second, the last thing you want to do is be fishing for the trusted organization. But this is where we find ourselves. As overwhelming as this is, if we are to discuss the post-disaster response more, what is exactly needed today from the organizations and from the response on the ground. This is my first part. And then what is needed from the people as hard as this question is, why do their voices matter today more than ever? And what role do they or do we as people play? So I think this is the political project, right? It's the way that relief and aid and shelter will be channeled or managed. Today, if, uh, for me, what we're doing today is an extension of the protest movement. But right now, we can't only be on the street and risk getting shot, shot or, or, or tear gassed. We have to also be doing something else. So for me, a continuation of the October Revolution is putting people at the heart of this disaster response plan, is getting people to set the agendas. There are two problems when you have a state vacuum or a murderous state, in our case, and a murderous complicit regime. There are two problems in that the agenda for aid will be well intended, but will be set outside according to programs and perceived priorities. It arrives too little too late, or it will be set according to capacity, as you were saying, of NGOs and how much they can manage. We know this after the war, we know this from other disasters. Sometimes it can take a decade for aid to come back. By, th by that time, people have already left their homes or left hope or left politics. So I think we are running against a very tight clock in terms of putting people, I can talk more about the project later, but we are like many, many others who like, did an interactive map, asked people to upload their needs. We also asked them to upload their complaints so that we're able to track who actually received aid and was it of good quality. It's a, it's a race towards dignity and towards saying this, this, our politics needs to be translated by sending aid to people and not to corrupt politicians. But it's not, it's not, a, it's not an easy task and it's not something that's been tried before. As long as you mentioned it, um, can you please elaborate more on Khadit Beirut and um, what, what have you been trying to do based on your experience on the ground and based on the current needs that have been uh, highlighted? I think like everybody in this country, we haven't slept in 19 days. We, you know, when you take a walk, it's, it's just, I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. So we're trying to put our brains together. Uh, we are a grassroots initiative, but we are also, I mean, not me, but colleagues are in health, in environment, in education, uh, in small to medium-sized enterprises that are trying to say, okay, based on this quick mapping and this data point, what, are, what do people need that we are able to think through and offer? For example, you know that there's not a map of primary healthcare centers in Lebanon. So we're teaming up with 250 primary healthcare centers to make their numbers available, to put them on, because people are calling, they want medicine, and so our nurse uh, and I'll say, you know, a shout out to Professor Nohad Yaz Begdoumet is saying we can't just give medicine like that to people. So it's really an infrastructure damage. So we're trying to work in these sectors uh, while saying all what we can offer is that we're survivors of the blast. But this time we want to we want to say how it needs to be done and we need to do it right. I want to go back a little bit and um, focus more on the challenges because I think that we know, we understand the challenges. Many people from abroad might be tuning in, understanding the general challenges in Lebanon. But as devastating as this explosion is and has been, our challenges don't, did not really start on the 4th of August. Our challenges are continuity of years of corruption and of years of failed state and government one, uh, one after another. So if you are, based on, uh, on your experience and on your knowledge of the society, if you are to discuss a little, these challenges that have been built up in the past, how are they translated today? And sadly, they are translated in the failure that we're seeing. But in a more focused way, how are they translated around us? I wish that we weren't right about this, but I mean, let Lebanon be a model to the world like apartheid South Africa and why apartheid is bad. Let us be a model for why sectarian power sharing system doesn't work. You can't 
bring warlords down from their tanks to wash their hands from blood and put a suit on them and make them ministers. It doesn't work. Their mindset is not designed to rebuild. Their mindset is not designed to be accountable to people. Our MPs have uh, bodyguards that shoot at people and kill them in the middle of the street. The, it's, it's a level of impunity and lack of responsibility and ethics that can't be blamed only on them. It is also the system that they put in place and that they're now trying to piece back together like Humpty Dumpty. They think they can you know, use the same myth, the lies that Lebanon is built on. Yeah? They are the guarantors of, of peace. They are the saviors of the sect. Where are the saviors that don't pick up garbage and can get electricity and oppress women and beat up protesters? These are the saviors and the guarantors of the system. So I think the challenges, I mean, number one is we're right. Now the international community is saying, oh, you know, we don't trust them. We don't want to spend a dime. Yeah, well, you know, we've been saying this for 20 years. So I think the challenge is really in, in, in a beast that has no problem killing elections under the gun are not elections. Just because they were elected doesn't mean that they can assassinate nine firefighters on TV. They sent them to die in front of their family. Elections does not make them the, the bosses over our lives and the air that we breathe. They took out debris from the city and burnt it up in Mansouri, causing another fire. They cannot be trusted with a single like with nothing, like I wouldn't even give them a piece of tissue. They cannot be trusted in anything. And I'll repeat, they cannot be trusted with the investigation. So that is another challenge that we have to seek our own accountability and transparency process around. And there's a lot of ideas I can talk about then about what justice means in such a system. But right now, the priority is people. That's why we're using the term medical professionals, doctors, not because we want to have expertise in counting dead bodies, but because people need to feel that there's credible people trying to help them and trying to set the agenda. Otherwise, it's going to be too late. It'll be a month and 10 days. And they have done nothing. They sent the army down 15 days later, 15 days later. Carmen, I want to go back to you in a little because I have a common question for you and Muna. But uh, for now, I want to thank you and to give the floor uh, for Muna to hear from your point of view. Um, in your opinion, what are the main threats and challenges that we foresee for the recovery of Beirut and of Lebanon, especially in the poorest areas that have been affected? Hi everyone and thank you so much for having me and thank you Carmen for reminding me one more time why we should be so angry uh, because it's, uh, it's been a few weeks of trying to just understand what has happened to us and really uh, maybe um, reminding ourselves that as we try to digest we should not forget to remain angry is actually super important. Uh, for me, what uh, exploded is exactly what uh, Carmen put her finger on. The explosion marked what we tried to allow to go peacefully in October, which is the Ta'if Accords and the warlords that became our rulers for the last 30 years. It's the so-called post-civil war order that was put in place and the way in which it addressed what we called first a reconstruction and which I think is a post-war corruption uh, for the last 30 years. And that order we, is what was denounced by people almost unanimously in an extraordinary form in October. October. And then as things fizzled out, we began to wonder what was going to happen next and how can we reorganize ourselves. And I think the explosion was here to say that this order cannot go peacefully. It has to go with shatter. And symbolically, one of the most affected neighborhoods by the blast is Beirut downtown. So if we take two minutes just to remember what happened in Beirut downtown, Beirut downtown in 1990 became the emblem for uh, how we were going to supposedly rebuild the country, except the way it was set in place is that people's property, all their claims, uh, the small grocery store, the person who had an old rent control, uh, all of these were taken together and sort of melted in a real estate company that was going to uh, create the grounds for an economic recovery for the country. Fast forward 30 years later, this reconstruction ended up being uh, the worst uh, speculative uh, uh, scheme that anyone has ever put on the planet. So you basically have the city score that's empty, real estate, which is expensive beyond means, mostly owned now by banks because no one else can afford it and the banks have recovered it. Uh, 
managed by the same political class and really dragging down the entire national economy to the point that we can say that Beirut downtown is only useful for when we want to protest. There's no other reason to go there. No, if there's no other reason for anyone to go there. Um, heritage preservation there turned into Disneyland. Either it became a militarized security or it became that little Saifi village, which I really hope everyone will see when you talk about preserving heritage in Marim Khayla and Jemaize. So you get a lesson of what you don't want. Uh, this for me is very simply uh, the threat moving forward. We know that the model of Solidaire was actually expanding in the neighborhoods around it. And particularly the district of Marm Khail and Jemaize were being subject to the same kind of vulture capitalism in the last 10, 15 years. So our mapping in the Beirut urban lab of empty buildings had already shown that there were over a hundred buildings that had been emptied of the residents, evacuated, and developers were ready to demolish them. If you count the number of uh, buildings of heritage, uh, of architectural value that were demolished in the last 20 years, they're 10 times more than those that are threatened right now by the blast. All, all this to say, we were set on a path to displace people, to empty this area, and the blast comes at a moment when it's going to try to precipitate this process. And of course, we have many Lebanese people who have their money in the bank right now and who don't know where the hell to put it. So they are desperate to place it in real estate. And the real danger is we get another uh, piecemeal solidaire in these districts. This will impoverish people more, this is what we care for, push them out and empty further Beirut from its ability to recover as an economic productive entity. The other threat, very threatened neighborhoods are of course Carantina. All of you know Carantina as uh, the area that was designed uh, by under, during that little uh, window of Ottoman rule by Ibrahim Basha when he came to Beirut. It was the moment when Beirut's port began to expand and they needed a place for sailors to stay before they come into the city. That's why it's the quarantine. Since then and continuously, this district has been the poor district of Beirut. The place where the city places functions like uh, waste management, like uh, uh, electricity gen, and you name it, functions that we don't want to see in the city, but also, a sa and sadly, the place where populations that are poor have actually gathered. So this is the place where Armenians, let's remember in 1914, were dropped by uh, boats when they were fleeing the massacres. And since then, one after the other, Kurds, low-income Lebanese populations. This was the site of the massacres in 1976 that marked the beginning of the Lebanese civil war. And today we see this is one of the most fragile districts that has a few clusters of residential buildings that are severely damaged. Um, I worry less in this district about an immediate gentrification or a buy of property than I worry about the populations, a lot of refugees, migrant workers, people who uh, sadly don't count in this uh, nation. And uh, for those to be cared for, to, to see a proper process of rehabilitation that can involve them, we need to make sure that the militarization is reduced, that people are not afraid to go back to their homes and that we provide the necessary support to do it. So this for me is sort of, if you want a landscape of the recovery and how it uh, connects to, uh, to things. Uh, the other piece, and I promise I'll stop, is uh, the fear that there is no state. And uh, while I completely agree with how corrupt and failed our government is, as a city planner, I have a very hard time imagining that we can set in place a recovery process without some form of coordinated governance that becomes the custodian of the common good. Urban, urban planning requires a custodian of the common good. Someone in whose name we say we will sacrifice each one as a citizen because we will have shared public space, shared streets, shared infrastructure. Our disaster in Lebanon is that we have had no custodian of the common good for the last 30 years. That's why our cities look the way they are. And today, more than ever, we miss this in this recovery. I have a follow-up question because I was um, I read the piece that that you yeah. wrote the New Arab about the reconstruction, and one sentence really struck me, um, and it, it basically it's a follow-up on what you were saying is that the re and I'm briefing it here, but the residents should be empowered to restore life in homes and workspaces. So 
How do you see this, um, this empowerment? In city planning, we know that what we're essentially doing is uh, telling people how they should live their lives, right? When you design a park, when you organize a street, when you set together an infrastructure, you're dictating for people whether they will walk or run to work or whether they will have to drive. You're dictating to people whether they can live a healthy life or not, who they will talk to and how they will talk to them, whether they will be able to live in a city or not. And if this is a political process then it starts with people and people have to be able to have a say in how it happens if you think of city planning as just imposing regulations I will impose heritage regulation on you I will force you not to sell your property the way the Minister of Finance uh, suggested a couple of weeks ago the outcome is very simple first in a country where the state has very little respect if at all people will not respect it look at what's happening with the covid restrictions now and second we know very well in lebanon that when you place a restriction those who are high heeled and well connected will break it and it will be the others who pay the price so to involve people means that we start with them we need to understand what's preventing you from uh, fixing a heritage building what's preventing you from coming back to your neighborhood what can i do to allow you to come back better to your neighborhood let's take a, one small example because they happen to be a cluster of people i've been talking to a lot young um, people from the creative community in Marim Khayel. Uh, you ask them, are you coming back? No way. Why aren't you coming back? Why did you pack? You're accused of having gentrified these neighborhoods and now you're just packing and leaving, like let's talk a little bit. And they tell you, I've been struggling for eight, nine months with my landlord. I'm renting, they want dollars. I don't have dollars. I don't have a source of income. If I have a few dollars, I'm leaving the country. Are you kidding me? So I'd rather stay with a friend, with a parent for a few months until I manage to have an exit strategy. And so you want to start with this narrative and to weave it with public decision makers to say, look, if you go to the landlord and you tell him we'll fix your building, we will channel the funds, but we want a contract in Lebanese pound for one year so that your tenant can come back. Then you've allowed this person to feel that maybe there's something they can trust back in this place. And then you bring them back and you bring back the employments they were creating, the spending they were making in the neighborhoods, and these start the channel. This is one very small example. So we don't just speak slogans. We give examples, concrete examples. We have thousands of those. And the reason why we know them is because in, in, in our research, in our practice in the last three, four years in Marm Khayel on the street, in, we've been talking to residents. So we know the challenges they were facing and we're trying to translate them into ways in which people can be brought on board. Just two ideas. I think that we have to do two parallel processes, unfortunately. One will be an inevitable process of political change, but to change the faces and to change the names is not something that's going to happen overnight. I think that what Professor Fawaz is talking about is also what I agree with, is that we also have to, we are the people and we need to be agents of change in the kind of city and the kind of politics and the kind of social contract we want to have together. What scared me a lot uh, was when I heard from a lot of foreign friends and international experts, talk to people that know aid, we asked them, please, can you send some cautionary tales? And without a doubt, like 50 people said, Look, we'll tell you what happened in other areas, but this is very different. It's not only different because Lebanon is particularly troubled, but it's also because of what the world is going through and the region. So I, I, you know, the only way to get out of this is if we can build our own agency that is based on evidence and get people to believe and to think that their vo voice and their, them staying and their money matters and to translate that the soonest chance we get into a political change because they're going to kill the rest of us if we don't. I want to build on that to, uh, and follow up with a question uh, for Muna. You were talking about, and you mentioned the post-war uh, reconstruction experience, and you mentioned some neighborhoods, and we spoke about the, we spoke a little about the lessons learned and the things to avoid. But my question to you is that when the power is not us, when the decision-making is imposed, how do you participate in the process of trying not to commit the same mistakes when it comes to the urban planning, to the buildings, to changing uh, the, the look of the city and the identity of the city. Is there something to be done? Look, I mean, right now it's a massive challenge because uh, it's going to be a, a process through which we're going to try to work with residents in order to uh, 
and business owners and uh, landlords in the districts that were demolished so that we can set in place the imagined process. And to be able to do that, we have to take everyone beyond their home towards the collective. And I think this is the big difference uh, that uh, we should make between what's called the post-war reconstruction, which is really when you think about rebuilding like a domino, right? This volume was gone, so now I rebuild this volume, and between a process of recovery that brings people beyond their homes also towards the collective the neighborhood level and beyond then the city level. And that's the, that's the place where I think you can begin to influence things. When, they, when residents begin to feel that they're stakeholders in the future of their neighborhoods and that there are shared projects that they can contribute to, if we can channel some of this aid money, some of these international organizations towards these collective goods, as opposed to simply my home and my house and my private matter, we begin to rebuild to reconstruct that faith in the collective. Don't forget, it's been 50 years that we're telling every Lebanese person, the collective doesn't matter. You just have to drive in Beirut to realize this, right? Everyone's cutting you off. Everyone feels that they can't trust that abstract other. And yet, if they see you in the eye and they recognize you, suddenly there's this sense of uh, extreme kindness and they're willing to kill themselves for you if they're your friend. So that lack of trust in the collective is what needs to be recovered. And I think urban planning is actually a good place to start it because it's unthreatening. Because it's a shared territory, whether you're Muslim or Christian or Druze or whatever you feel uh, your, your belonging is, you are dying and you realize this from the same dirty air. You are unable to, you have to commute every day for an hour and your life is becoming miserable because your sidewalk is dirty and the trash is piling up. And so that's a place where people feel unthreatened to speak about the failure of our political class and that's collective so i really feel it's a place where we can begin to build from that and um i don't like at all to talk about post-war recoveries or post-disaster recoveries as opportunities i feel that there is uh that it's so hard what just happened that it's hard to even imagine this as a, as an opportunity for something but perhaps it's a way in which we can begin to reignite some of the collect sense of the collective uh and from there uh, build on it. And we've seen a lot of young people flock from all over Lebanon. Some, yes, carried by buses of uh, uh, NGOs that have political affiliations and wearing t-shirts with very clear names, but others also just saying, I couldn't just stay home. So we need to build on that. Can we just rely on NGOs to rebuild? And what does it mean to work outside the state now with all of the challenges? We know you've mentioned it. Um, you've mentioned it before and we discussed it a little during this panel now, but I want to re-emphasize on this because really the solution cannot be just relying on volunteering, on cleaning our own houses and on NGOs. I went on the street in October because I wanted to build a state, not because I don't want a state. I believe in state building, in piecemeal, in full form, whatever opportunity I have. I believe in it and I don't, it's not that I ideologically think that all societies across history were governed by states. No, I'm a scholar. I realize that the state is a small short moment in the history of how peoples have organized themselves historically. And I imagine that we will move as a humanity towards other forms. But right now in Lebanon, that's the only thing we can hold on to. So we have to hold on to it. What we're seeing is that some of the NGOs are doing amazing work. They're really by the side of people, they have competence, they have expertise. However, we also are seeing NGOs overlap on each other. We have, people have no recourse. Uh, I, again, we have this example of this lady who was told by the NGO that they're very very sorry, but they can't repair the wood in her building. And if she wants a window, she's going to have to live with aluminum. And she called me saying, you're an architect and what do I do? And my reaction was, uh, I don't know, because there's no coordinating body. So I don't know if I should advise her next week uh, to put aluminum because that's the pragmatic thing to do. She has to come back. That's my priority. But maybe in three weeks, someone will come with old heritage wood and then I would have really harmed her. Uh, and on the other hand, if I don't have visibility, it's very hard for me to do it. So what I'm trying to imagine is a process in which we can have a panel of competent people that may include some members of the public sector that can coordinate this effort and channel the funding and 
put themselves as accountable towards uh, residents. Because if the NGO fixes your wall and structurally there's a problem and the building falls, or a room falls on someone and someone is hurt, people need accountability. And that's why we, cannot, we really cannot do it without a, a co a, an accountable coordinating body. Um, right now, none of the public institutions has demonstrated its ability at all to do it, but I don't think it means we can simply pretend they're not here. My fear is if we do, we're gonna end up with even more army. So I, uh, I would like to see some of the public bodies more engaged in this recovery and to tolerate them with a lot of oversight so that we don't end up with, uh, with thefts, but at the same time, we don't end up also undermining further the possibility of a state. And I wanna remind everyone about what happened in 2006, when the reconstruction was largely not done by the state, what we ended up with is a group of the population, even further away from the possibility of the collective, feeling hijacked to one political party with even more allegiance to this political party because that's the party that built their homes. We have to build a collective. Active. And that has to be in some form of a public. Thank you, Mona. Uh, Carmen? I heard this question about the state also in a couple of meetings um, uh, that uh, some people are accusing us of taking the role of the state. So as a reminder, we are here because there is not a disaster unit or response unit or whatever it's called in, in, in modern countries. We are here because there isn't a registry of NGOs and people were, young people were put, picking up dead bodies from under the rubble. Now that we're starting to have some agency and some voice and a little bit of credibility, although there's a lot of chaos, like Mona was saying, of course, tens of NGOs will walk in and do needs assessment and build things, but we are in this situation because they are not just absent, but they are complicit in this crime. Of course, I teach in the public administration track in my department. I dream, I've dreamt of a state, you know, ever since you know, I was born, of course. And the way that we're thinking about health and environment, education and small businesses in Khadit Beirut is, is, is imagine that there is a transition of power and to have a viable system with viable guidelines about how to minimize hazard, how to get rid of the waste, how to rebuild the school system amidst the pandemic that anybody can use. So I can assure you that my aspiration is that this is taken, but it is them that will have to prove themselves responsive to the local community. It is them that will have to win my credibility as an activist because what I'm doing now is a continuation of the protest that they try to oppress. So of course, this needs to go to the state, but the state needs to win our trust. Huh? I'm scared of the database that the, that the state is collecting and of some NGOs, of course. So at best we can become watchdogs. That's why in Khadid Beirut, we're also collecting people's complaints. So maybe their data was abused or maybe like Mona was saying, they were promised and nothing happened or they were given masalan, wrong advice on medicine or on windows and nobody you know, wants to be in this, in this position. And I think it's really, really important because a lot of the international donors are saying we can't surpass the state and I would say nobody asked you to, but who in the state do you have a registry, forget the NGOs, is there a registry of capable civil servants that are not partisan at the end of the day, show me public offices that have, you know, secure uh, databases and system, when was the last census that they did, why must it be the Beirut Urban Lab at AUV that is carrying out this work that they do so professionally. But why was, must be we counting buildings instead of you know, thinking about our lives? Where are societies thinking? We're, we're thinking how to dispose of rubble and debris and how to set up mobile clinics because people can't leave the house. We are in this position, not just because they're absent, but because they are complicit in this crime. And of course, anything we build needs to be scaled, but it has to be scaled uh, in the hands of people who will hold it with as much um, passion and, and careful, you know, Beirut is like a, like a broken child, to be so careful with people, like Mona is saying, very careful, every word we say, every, every, it's, it's people still picking up dead bodies, it's not a joke, they cannot come and, and claim a, a partisan success and we will not let them, this is why the relief effort has to be better organized, but it has to be in parallel with a political process that is also viable, that is also evidence-based, uh, that is not that doesn't sound to people um, like we're dreaming no we're not dreaming somebody asked in the chat what kind of government do you aspire for a functional one right and one that doesn't fund uh, uh, sectarianism just like slavery was funded it was in south africa slavery wasn't a societal thing oh blacks don't like whites and why don't christian like muslims i mean this is outdated 
identity politics, slavery was an economy. It was legal. Empires were built based on it. And the same with the sectarian system. It makes legal all the oppressive practices against women. It makes an economy out of uh, uh, spiritual co courts. It makes an economy out of what Muna was saying, but rebuilding parts in return for votes. So we, these, two, these two have to work together, but unless there is a political transition, no, I don't trust the state that doesn't pick up garbage, that gave out uh, like um, expired chicken to poor people uh, during the lockdown. That did it, that it took them four months to map. They wanted to give out 400,000 people, so 400,000 lira for poor families. It took them three months to map poor areas, whereas Mona or any one of Mona's students can tell you by heart where the poor people are. I wouldn't trust them picking up my trash, frankly. I wouldn't trust them cleaning my car. So they have to prove to civil society and to the local community that they are viable. In the meantime, yes, it's chaos among NGOs because it's a disaster. It's 3,000 tons of explosives that blew up the city. I mean, it's not because you know, nobody has the competence to deal with this. Even international organizations are advising, we, we don't know how to do this. If, you know, 9-11, there was a state, the police came, people left, you know, ground zero. This is, this is a massacre, I mean. I'm just reading now the questions and something, something came up. Um, and it's a bit of a political question, but I think that it serves the purpose. So foreign powers seem um, to enable the same ruling class over and over again. Is there any hope foreign states like France or the EU can adjust their policy to empower ordinary Lebanese to displace this ruling class? Or only will it happen by a Liban Lebanese, um, Lebanese homegrown revolution or more protests or more pressure? Look, um, political transition, the, the big type, the transformation is often the result of multiple things, right? And sometimes enabling geopolitics or international politics, right? They can create an enabling factor, they create a window of opportunity. But of course, any political shift or for the Lebanon that we aspire to live with should come from the Lebanese people. That's why I said like the international community's um, awareness or recognition about corruption in the state is welcomed. But it's something we knew about for many, many years. You know how many technical assistance programs the UNDP has paid in Lebanon and result for zero reform? You know how many election reform projects have been funded in the, in the country in the last 30 years? Probably tens. I participated in tens. For, for which kind of election? Gerrymandered district, no women, uh, no, no women representation, clientelism as much as you want. Sectarian ideological parties with weapons get to run. So I think that the, you know, the whole question about, I mean, I'm a pragmatist. I think it's good that you know, there's, there's this change in, in how the world is looking at the country. But just like with relief, and that's why I'm saying relief is political, it has to be also led by us, the locals, right? So it's not another mandate or another uh, uh, um, a Syrian tutelage for 30 years, which the international community put in, in 1990. So I think if we're smart enough and fast enough, that we're able to set the agenda, be it about buildings or streets or rivers or health or medicine or environment together with a political alternative, then I think I really do believe that there is there is a chance because the crime is so big. I have a question here um, in the Q&A and I want to, to reshape it a little because I imagine that Mona can probably answer this because we were talking about coordination and about the example of the woman with the wooden window. and. Um, um, so there's a question that, is there an effort to create a committee to coordinate the efforts of all NGOs? Um, I am sure you can find a group of local experts to advise. And I want to shift that when we talk about urban planning. Does the government come to experts like you? Do you have a saying <laughs> in these things after all of the studies, after all of the lessons learned? Does anyone come to you and tell you that, hey, you're a professor in this and that? Um, you get to have the saying in how the city is redesigned or is reconstructed. We want to add to Carmen's list. I, I, I have, I have a lot of grievances as well, and I fully. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah, of course, no one ever comes and tells you how do you feel. Sometimes, because the World Bank asks for uh, an expert representative from civil society, they'll ask a U B, and I'll be sent on a committee. So I know, for example, and this will scandalize everyone, that Beirut has an urban resilience plan that uh, was more than two, that cost more than two million dollars that should have uh, been unrolled right right after the worst uh, disaster response an urban resiliency plan is a plan that unrolls the response right away so you prepare ahead of time for in the event that you have a crisis 
And uh, what was unrolled was five days after the blast, they were distributing brooms. Uh, and it took five days, right? Everyone already had a broom by then and was collecting. So, uh, so yes, uh, they, they don't look for us. But yes, there is a genuine effort at organizing. And I think what you're seeing now on the ground with people from the universities, with the NGOs, with members of different political organizations and activist groups, and with donors from abroad, uh, is a genuine effort to coordinate and imagine how this is going to happen. A lot of what I'm doing in the last few days is really answer calls from uh, large-scale donors, uh, from uh, people at the World Bank, uh, in United, different United Nations offices, and also colleagues in, uh, in universities and NGOs, that local NGOs here, to think about how is it that we can set in place, what is it that we want to do. The syndicates, the order of engineers, the order of lawyers and the contractors have also come together and they've said we're going to try to form a civic committee that will organize uh, this aid. The contractors have moved even further and said, look, we donate our work. I was just on a call with a contractor that said, I have a land, I'll make it available. We'll work with NGOs, we'll organize this district, we'll secure the funding. So you're seeing this genuine effort at coordination. It's difficult, it's bottom up. And I, I can say, frankly, we were just wondering if we don't manage to get the governor to say, okay, I can play a game here. I can play my role here. What do you do? You have to go to the big donors and tell them, look, coordinate between each other and set up a form that can help the local NGOs coordinate. So there are means to do it. We have the capability to do it, but I, um, but it's going to be more difficult. It's going to fall more on the shoulder of, uh, uh, of people who are volunteering their time and working this on the side. But I guess it's the price we pay for not having succeeded in setting in place uh, a real uh, society in 1990 that rendered those who made the civil war accountable. We keep going and dreaming of the model of South Africa because they had a truce and reconciliation committee and because they held those people accountable uh, at the end of the at the end of the apartheid regime, and that's something that we have failed to do, and I think we're paying the price now. So, how can communities and people themselves, who aren't part of NGOs or organized communities, if you want, how can they be organized and um, be present at the heart of uh, of the response? just have to go online to see what is happening, but you can simply walk to the neighborhood and you'll realize we have been setting up community meetings on the ground uh, in quarantina uh, with NGO partners. So what uh, we did very early on is we said, look, the quarantina is relatively small. Let's bring all the NGOs in one meeting. And so we called 20, we had 48 with the residents on, the, on like a week after the blast. And what we did is a spreadsheet and we organized, okay, what do you do? What do you do? And with this, we sort of created classifications and we organized them so that people can coordinate uh, the support. Every day there are volunteers who arrive to the neighborhoods. Every day they, uh, uh, they are by, uh, without even having to call anyone, they are joining teams and they are becoming part of, uh, uh, of, of the relief work. So this is there. There are also institutions that are calling uh, online for people to come and volunteers. Big NGOs like Nusaned or Afrejoie uh, have an open call for volunteers and can place you on any day you want to go. Same for the Center for Civic Engagement at AUB that's still going into homes and still finding homes of elderly people who have still not emptied their homes from glass and sort of taping the windows and supporting in this work and looking forward towards better, uh, more repair. So definitely the efforts are there. They're everywhere. You just have to sort of take yourself the courage to go and, uh, and see what is happening, walk the street and see what is happening or hook up to any of the NGOs online. But I, I want to just add to that. And I think Bahi in the, in the chat is saying, you know, he would love to do this work. Me too, Bahi. I think that, I think that, you know, I think the, the volunteering spirit we saw on the ground is, is beautiful. It reflects definitely, you know, something about our sense of civic duty towards one another that hasn't been destroyed. But I also think volunteering only for the sake of volunteering just makes us tired and it's not productive. It has to be translated into a political process. And from everything that I've heard, I think it's no, no one, no one is, um, 
how do you say this? Like no, no one wants to go spend a day in the sun, right? I think I think that the politics around it is everybody on the street, five-year-old kid, 95-year-old man is saying, they're the culprits. We're not gonna wait for them to fix this. We're just gonna get back on our two feet and then we will aim for justice this time. And I have not hope, but I have this solid feel that it's it's impossible that they're gonna be able to piece together this Humpty Dumpty that broke. They can't because their lies are so uncovered and it's so typical, it's typical out of any authoritarian textbook, the way that they're behaving with people and continuing to oppress voices and arrest people over a Twitter uh, post. I mean, it's, it's incredible. They live on Mars. Um, and so, yeah, me too. I don't want to volunteer for the sake of volunteering. I don't think we need to be doing the government's job, but I think that we need to be building faith in each other in order to build also faith in new political leadership. So that's the way I'm seeing the relief phase. For me, it's very political. And I have to build on that. I have a political question. I also extracted it from a question here. Um, and someone asked, don't you feel that the problem is bigger than Lebanon? Because there is a regional and international level also of powers that are involved. And now with the aid, if you look at the span of things in Lebanon, if you look at, um, at where the aid is coming from, if you look at the international flagships that are uh, in the port, um, you know, the temporary uh, local hospitals that are set up, um, don't you think, Carmen, that there's possibly a bigger issue here than just local politics? This is, this is also part of the myth that we grew up in in Lebanon. Oh, we are cursed. Oh, it is our destiny. It's bigger than me and you. I think if we think like this, we shoot ourselves in the foot. I believe we have agency. I believe I have agency, not just to channel aid, but to sit on the table and say where aid should go. And I believe in people like Mona and many, many others have agency to lead and they would definitely be, you know, ages more competent, uh, light years ahead of everyone. I believe in that. It's not something I'm preaching. I, I strongly believe in that. Yes, of course, there is a big regional international game. I'm not, I'm not silly. I'm not, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not in my right mind. I know this very well, but I believe that there's agency. And if we keep on thinking that somebody is going to save us or some country is going to come save us, all of this aid, of course, follows foreign agendas. What can I do at my local vantage point to make sure it goes to people while building a political project? That's why I'm staying in this country to do, frankly. We would be uh, crazy to think that we can address our issues before global regional issues are addressed, but a lot of it is our making. We created the Ponzi scheme. We allowed these individuals to stay in power. A lot of what is happening to us is, is really something that uh, was designed by our political class and uh, we can undo it. I have no doubt that we can undo it. Uh, and I. I think work began a long time ago. It didn't become, it didn't just begin now, but we're beginning to see now more clearly that uh, uh, what we've been dreaming and imagining and talking about is actually materializing also in the efforts that people are capable of doing. And I think also uh, we, have, we have less and less to lose if we don't do it. So this is going to encourage way more people to uh, to be on the front line. So like Carmen, I, I have some hope. Maybe a little less, but I do. <laughs> I know that um, a lot of people have a lot of questions here, but I want to encourage everyone because we're all active on social media and um, we all write about these topics. So if there are any reoccurring questions, um, please feel free to reach out to uh, Mona and Carmen. Um, this is the end of our time for tonight, but I really want to thank you both first for this, um, for this very informative panel, um, an all women panel that I am really happy that I was able to moderate in these tough times. And, um, and thank you for the very vivid and realistic answers and for answering all of the tough questions that I know for sure many people um, had in mind. So I would like to thank you both for that. Thank you, uh, Luna, and thank you, Carmen, really, and the New Arab for having us uh, uh, tonight. It's, uh, I, I learned a lot, so thank you. Thank you, and thank you, Luna, for being so strong on such a tough, tough moment. So I hope to see you soon. And thank see you, you, Luna, also. Bye. Thank you both.